You're listening to More Than a Song, episode 133. and welcome to this episode of More Than a Song. My name is Michelle Nizat, and this is the podcast dedicated to helping you discover the truth of Scripture hidden in today's popular Christian music. My goal is to teach you to connect portions of God's Word with the songs you're singing along with on the radio, to help you meditate on truths that will transform your way of thinking and ultimately your life. My new favorite verse these days as it relates to Christian music comes from Psalm 49. And it says, For my words are wise and my thoughts are filled with insight. I listen carefully to many proverbs and solve riddles with inspiration from a harp. That encapsulates what I think Christian songwriters do when they do it well. And they are solving the riddles of life by listening carefully to the truth of Scripture And then, with the inspiration of music, are sending truth-filled messages into our hearts. And this week's message, Never Too Far Gone by Jordan Feliz, speaks to many of us who somehow believe the lie that either we can hide from God on the one hand, or that we are too far gone to be used by Him. And I can't wait to debunk that lie by diving into Scripture and into the life of a very important man. But first, let's listen. I want to show you a clear picture of someone in God's word who seemed too far gone to the Christians of his day. But first, I can't shake the truth that I know is tucked into Psalm 139. So let's slip over there first. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now that section of scripture provides such clear proof that you can't hide from God. But even more critical, if you read it closely, he doesn't want you to. Verse 10 says, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. I need to know that God will hold me fast no matter how far I think I've settled apart from him. Like this is a drop the mic kind of section of scripture. You know, you could just read all that all week and tuck it into your memory. And every time you hear Jordan Feliz's song, you could just think of that. I just love all of Psalm 139. And if you don't go any further than that this week, I know that God will meet you there. But I have a few more minutes to spare. And many of you look forward to the Bible interaction tool exercises that I share each week. And so I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm not going to drop the mic just yet. Plus, I'm really excited about the character study this week. So I want to keep going. And as I mentioned, I've, I've received fabulous feedback about the Bible interaction tool exercises that I share each week. You know, some of the, the listeners are saying that the bites, the B-I-T-E's, are their favorite part of every episode. I love that because like I say each week, they're they're just simply my habits that I use to prepare my thoughts for you. So the fact that um, they are resonating with my listeners and that they're resonating so strongly with you, it's truly an honor and a blessing. However, now how is that? Doesn't that just sound like a teacher who says, yes, that's right, but Okay, well, that's the tone I'm going for because I was a little convicted this week as I was listening to a discussion on good versus the highest good. And I'm even going to throw a little Latin at you right now because I learned it and I can. So uh, not that I speak Latin. Well, beyond carpe diem and alma mater, I am no Latin scholar, okay? But I liked this one and it is sumum bonum. 
Now, you may have heard of summa cum laude, which is the um, bestowed upon college graduates, meaning highest distinction. Okay, so summa or summum in this case refers to highest. So summum bonum means the highest good. So in the context of what I learned, where I learned this phrase this week, the comment was, we often do a lot of things that are good and reasonable, but we miss out on the highest good because it's not as concrete as a checklist or just like that box, you know, the to-do list that you can scratch off. So I immediately thought of my Bible interaction tool exercises because the bites are good. They're even so good that they're resonating enough that almost every email I get from my listeners mentions them. And as a writer and a speaker, I'm getting a little excited because I found something that's resonating and sometimes resonating so much that you are actually interacting with God's word in new and exciting ways. And some of you are even sharing your findings with others. Good, good, good. But when I consider summum bonum, When I consider the highest good, it is not checking off a new technique, trying a new tool, reading a new verse or a new chapter or a new book. All of those are good. In fact, all of those hopefully lead to the highest good, and that is, drum roll, communion with God. You see, I may take that a little for granted because every verse and every prayer and every song and every moment in meditation, every new discovery... Every bite, every Bible interaction tool exercise, every bite I take makes me fall in love with Jesus more and more. And all of them point me to deeper communion with God. But when I say communion with God, I mean sharing intimate thoughts and feelings. And it comes from the English word common. So sharing thoughts and feelings in common with God, which is the farthest thing from a checklist. So as we dive into God's word and the character study that I want to get to today, I want to encourage you, if you've never had communion with God, if you've never felt like you had anything in common with him, much less sharing intimate thoughts and feelings, don't fret. You are never too far gone. So let's consider someone who for all intents and purposes, we all would consider too far gone. And that man is Paul formerly known as Saul. In fact, this is indeed a bite, a Bible interaction tool exercise, and that is to complete a character study. So studying characters, the individual people in God's word is so fun and enlightening, and I hope one day you'll try it on your own. But for today, I'll go ahead and lead the discussion. And I want to start in Galatians chapter 1 because Paul gives us a bit of a summary of himself when he writes this. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Now, I know that was a little bit of a longer section than I normally read, but I want you to get this idea and I want you to get just a clear picture. Paul was a persecutor of the early church. He was not just a verbal persecutor. He he didn't just file motions in court or get nasty in the media. You know, he oversaw the execution of Christians. And Acts chapter 7 tells of a man named Stephen 
who the Bible describes as being full of God's grace and power. And it also says he performed great wonders and signs among the people. And when Stephen was accused of saying blasphemous words against Moses and God, he was brought before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin is like um, a, a supreme court in ancient Israel. And so when Stephen was brought before the Sanhedrin and he boldly shared the gospel message, he, he built his case from the beginning, from Father Abraham all the way through the Messiah, they got really mad. They were enraged and they stoned Stephen to death. And Acts chapter one says this, and Saul approved of their killing him. Now he thought he was doing the right thing. As he writes in Galatians, I know I just read it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He truly did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Truly, truly. And as C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. And I suppose that Saul subscribed to the notion that he was liar or lunatic or both, but definitely not lord. And therefore, he felt like all that was against everything that he believed in. And he was so zealous that Saul intensely, intensely persecuted the church. So then we read in verse 15 the infamous but. Okay, we're still in Galatians chapter 1. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. And th- this is a profoundly simplified summarization of quite a dramatic conversion experience. So let's head over to Acts chapter 9 to read all about it. So in Acts chapter 9 verse 1, it starts out by saying, Meanwhile, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, He might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now a companion bite, a companion Bible interaction tool exercise to the character study is the Bible interaction tool exercise, the bite of remembering that the characters described in God's word are real. And what happens to them really happened. And this scene is a doozy. Just think about this a bit. Saul is zealous. He is blinded in his passion against the way. And the way is anyone following Christ. I love that, the way. And he goes to the authority in charge and he asks for letters. He asks for permission to go to Damascus and hunt down followers in that city. He is a man on a mission when suddenly He is struck down with an intense light and a voice from heaven. So what do you think his response was in that moment? A pretty natural one as far as I'm concerned. He asked, who are you, Lord? And he's recognizing, obviously, that if you get struck down by light and you hear a voice from heaven, that uh, that voice carries authority. And the supreme authority of this voice confused Saul a little bit because, you know, he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was serving God. So I think this idea of why do you persecute me probably threw him for a loop. And so, you know, who are you is not an unreasonable question. And so with one sentence, Jesus Christ rocked his world. He says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Can you imagine this experience? I'm pretty sure at this point Saul isn't thinking, well, isn't this just like God to be pleased to reveal his son to me in this manner? No, I said it, but you can think about it all week. This one sentence rocked Saul's world because it wasn't evildoers against Yahweh that he had been persecuting. It was Jesus. Jesus. How can this be? I thought he was a lunatic and a liar. Trust me on this one. This took some processing on the part of Saul. And Acts goes on to say, 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, you know Saul wasn't thinking about his fantasy football team here during these three days. So what could have he been considering? Um, I'm thinking the face of Stephen, for one. Uh, the signs that he missed all along the way, maybe the screams of the men and women he drug away to be imprisoned, the screams of the men and women in the other executions he oversaw, the questions, oh, the questions and sorrow and confusion he must have felt. Not only would we have considered Saul too far gone for God to use, but I'm sure at this moment, Saul Saul saw himself as too far gone. For God to use. So he waited and waited for God to tell him what to do next. Now, I know how cray cray I can get when I'm left alone to my thoughts and the what ifs. If Jesus struck me blind with light and spoke to me in an audible voice from heaven, I mean, the kind of audible voice where the there's other people who can confirm it. Oh, the what ifs and the what nows and all that that would be running through my mind. And then, and then in verse 10 of Acts 9, there's this sweet, sweet Ananias. I love it. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. <laughs> I'm kind of with Ananias. Um, Lord, are you kidding me? That guy? He is too far gone. But God didn't need Ananias' opinion. He had already determined Saul's purpose. And I suppose the part about, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name, was a slight encouragement to Ananias. And despite his reluctance, he obeyed God's instructions. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he he regained his strength. Immediately after this message, Saul's sight was restored and he responded with an outward expression of an inward change through baptism. Then, then Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't the man this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And so after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So as you can see here, there was not swift forgiveness for Saul. He was a monster. Okay, think ISIS beheadings in our current day. But Saul was no dummy either. You see, he was extremely educated, supremely familiar with the arguments of the followers of Christ that he was the Messiah. And when the scales fell from his eyes, they fell from his heart too. He was able to see that Christ really was the fulfillment of prophecy. And he knew these prophecies well. And and I guess he wasn't too far gone after all. In fact, it's like he concluded in Galatians, God set him apart from his mother's womb, called him by his grace, and was pleased to reveal his son in Saul so that he might preach Christ among the Gentiles. But the part that I want to draw your attention to now is that Saul's immediate response was not to consult any human being. He writes, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. 
Now, we don't have a lot of details as to what Paul did during this time in Arabia, but we do know this. He was there three years, three years investing in his communion with God, consulting his newfound Savior. I read it already, but Galatians 1.11, he tells us that the gospel he preached was not from human origin. He received it by revelation from Jesus. He didn't learn it from the other apostles. He learned it straight from Jesus. That develops great intimacy, just like the intimacy the other apostles had with Jesus, that, that walking and talking type of intimacy, a deep communion, sumum bonum, the highest good. And I want to give you another quick couple of bites before we finish today. And I know that the majority of my listeners love music. I mean, that's how you found my podcast. So here's an interesting bite for you to use, and that is to use music during your reading, your study, and your meditation. I subscribe to Pandora. Some of you might use Spotify or another service like that, but I've created a channel of epic soundtracks, and this gives me all the great epic music scores from all kinds of movies, but the key is this. Um, They are, well, epic sounding and when I'm reading an epic story like Saul's conversion it just does something for me to have that epic building music in the background and then if I go back to the idea of sumum bonum and this idea of communion with God I love piano music so I have this classical solo piano station that I listen to when I'm journaling or meditating or praying and these songs tend to slow me down you know easing my breathing and let me for lack of a better word I guess just chill And I like these stations because they don't have words to distract me from what I want to focus on, which is God's word or my thoughts and prayers and hopefully God's response back to me. And it may seem a little out there to you, but try it. You might find that this new bite makes a big difference as you focus in on sumum bonum, the highest good, that intimacy with God. So with this in mind and creating an environment and setting aside time and space to develop intimacy with the Father, it's not, it's not just worth it, it's necessary. And if you consider Paul again, he did that. He went away for three years. He didn't consult anyone, but he communed with the Father. In other words, he reduced his distractions. And that foundation, that communion with God, it served him well. Because not only was he not too far gone, but God had a pretty profound mission for him to complete. So what about you? What can we learn from Saul? Well, no matter how right you think you are, remember Saul thought he was right. But when God speaks to you, you can repent and change direction and be used by him. And then no matter who else thinks you're too far gone, God is the one who defines your purpose. And then finally, removing yourself from the opinion of others and distractions that may be good but are not the highest good, that can lead to intimacy and communion with God. Invest in that. So what's next? We'll read all about the conversion of Saul in Acts chapter 9. Try reading it with some epic music playing in the background. And then read Saul's, uh, I'm sorry, Paul's summary of his conversion in Galatians chapter 1. Perhaps in, in either of these places, you might get lost in the story and keep reading. That would be wonderful. Don't forget that Paul was a real person and all of this really happened to him. And then follow Paul's example. Get away with God this week. Maybe play some soothing music that will quiet your soul as you move away from that checklist mentality and toward intimacy with God. Give him some space in your schedule and your mind to speak to you. And then while you're in God's word this week, let me know how you're doing. Email me, michelle at michellekneezat.com. Hop on Twitter or Facebook and we can talk about what you're learning. Now, before I let you uh, know what song will be featured next week, I want to shout out to Gloria from Connecticut, Valerie from Minnesota, Lisa from Florida, Brenda from somewhere in the U.S., Kimberly from Utah, and Lisa from Maryland. These are my newest subscribers to my website. Welcome. Now, the benefit of subscribing is I will email you once a week, and in that email, you will get a weekly memory verse resource to display on your smartphone, desktop, tablet, or you can even print it out. And you'll also get an email recap of the week's episode and get instant access to any of the extra resources that I create for my episodes from time to time. And all, all, all of that is just my way of saying thank you for listening. So head over to michellekneezat.com to subscribe today. And then don't miss an episode of my podcast. You can subscribe in iTunes. And while you're there, would you leave me a written review and a star rating? This encourages me, um, but mostly it also helps me stay visible to new listeners and gives me some credibility. And as always, if you take the time to review my podcast, I will take the time to personally thank you right here on the podcast. 
Well, that's it for this episode of More Than a Song. Next week, I will use the song To Live is Christ by Sidewalk Prophets. If you liked this episode, would you mind sharing it with others? I've made it really easy. With one click, you can share via Facebook, Twitter, or email. Just head over to michellekneesat.com forward slash 133. And then while you're there, I'd love to hear from you. Click on comment to join the conversation. Until next time, take time to meditate on God's word and consider his ways.